Lisa Punchinello. Lisa Punchinello was the Don's wife. Mona Sachs. Lisa's evil twin. Your safety's off, evil twin. You might hurt someone with that gun of yours. Lisa's the damsel in distress. I'm the professional. I'd blow you away without batting an eye. Sure, and you can check out my credentials splattered all over this joint. Welcome back, everybody. Before we had Max meet Friend of the Wolf and kill him, now we have Max meeting Mona Sachs. Here it says, Lisa Puccinello was a Don's wife. And Max believed that it was Lisa Puccinello in front of him. The Don is named Angelino Puccinello, just to remind you. And here Mona Sachs says, no, I'm not Lisa. I'm actually her evil twin. So she's admitting that she's evil and that she's a twin of Lisa. And Max says, your safety's off, evil twin. You might hurt someone with that gun of yours. So he understands that she is dangerous. He understands that she is a femme fatale. And Mona Sachs says, Lisa's the damsel in distress. I'm the professional. I'd blow you away without batting an eye. So she's saying, I'd kill you without even caring. So don't test me. And Max says, sure. And you can check out all my credentials spluttered all over those joints. So he's like, well, you think you're dangerous. I'm more dangerous. <laughs> he's doing the typical, anything you can do, I can do better. So I like this kind of moment. Just two people trying to one-up each other. I also really like how Mona's gun... I think that's a Colt 45, isn't it? It like really like shines outwards without the the white, or the whatever metal that is, silver. <laughs> I don't know my metals. It really shines out with that brightness. And then Max's gun is just like hidden within her arm, so you can't really see his gun, but you can definitely see hers. Um, but this part's really good because now we get to meet the first femme fatale of the game, a very big part of the first game. Oh, well, I guess not too big, but it's pretty big. But she becomes an even bigger part in the second game because in the second game, they did not care about symbolism at all. <laughs> I'm sorry. As much as I like the second game, gameplay-wise, adding the whole, like, hey, Max Payne and Mona Sachs are getting it all and in his dreams, um, as much as I like that, it doesn't fit with the symbolism in this game because we have Lisa Puccinello and Mona Sachs. These are twins. Mona and Lisa, as you can see when I put them together, their names are meant to be Mona Lisa, which is in reference to the famous painting by Leonardo da Vinci. And that kind of painting was one of the most famous examples of Italian Renaissance. Renaissance is a revival of the classics. So you can see from that kind of reference, very clearly, her character, merged with Lisa, are meant to be a revival of the classics due to them being named after a renaissance painting. In old noir movies, we had the femme fatale. In old noir movies, we also had the damsel in distress. We would have terrible moments where, you know, somebody gets killed, man has to go to get vengeance. Hey, didn't that happen with uh, Max's wife over there? Yeah, I think so. So there was a damsel in distress, Max's wife. She got killed in the beginning, horrifically, brutally on the bed. We're gonna see Lisa Puccinello. We're gonna see. We're gonna see Lisa Puccinello. I cannot say the word Puccinello. <laughs> we're gonna see Lisa soon, and we're gonna see how she dies. So get ready for that. But uh, one thing I want to kind of establish uh, very simply first, but then once we see Lisa, I'm gonna establish it even more later on. We have another motif here with three women: Max's wife, Mona, and Lisa. And these three women have different names, very much like there is a three-part archetype in Norse mythology of three women who have different names, but they kind of represent the same thing as like a sort of Odin's wife. So the wife of wisdom. Remember that part. The wife of wisdom. The one who's married to wisdom. Right? The one who's in a relationship with the wisdom. Related to the wisdom. <laughs> I don't know how much more clear I had to say it, but I'm just giving you a hint for that part. You can go ahead and tell me in the comments what you think the, the three women related to wisdom are. And yeah, I'll tell you if it's, I'll tell you if you're right or something, you know, who cares? So, but the important part is that it's part of Norse mythology, and you'll really like it once I reveal it. So stay tuned for that, I guess. Oh boy, cliffhangers in a series that doesn't get finished at all. <laughs> Jack couldn't have framed you, not the state he was in. We're after the same slime bag. Angelo Punchinello is the one who murdered your friend and framed you with it. You know this for a fact. I've got my sources. I don't have a clue these days. I just shoot them as they come. Who put a contract on the Archfiend? This one's mine. I hate the guts of that sadistic wife beater. Mona reveals that uh, Jack couldn't have framed you. He was not in the state, not in the state that he was in. Yeah, Jack was insane and he was hopped up on drugs and he was a couple marbles short of a full deck of cards, <laughs> as they say. 
And then Mona says, we're after the same slime ball. So Angelino Puccinello is the slime ball that she's referring to. And she says, that's the one who murdered your friend and framed you with it. So she's not talking about the one who killed Max's family. Uh, somebody who is tricked into killing thanks to Loki. Oh, would you look at that? Angelo Puccinello is a Loki. He's not a friend rear, he's a Loki. Who else is like Loki? Well, later on, Max says, you know that's for a fact. And then she's like, I got my sources. We don't know who her sources are. We don't know how she gets their information. She seems to have some kind of relationship with wisdom or something, but we don't know where her information comes from. And then she, he says, I don't have a clue these days. I just shoot them as they come. So he doesn't know what he's doing. He just points guns at people, pointing guns at him. <laughs> he's like, he's like, I'm just doing what I'm, what I'm, I'm kind of like, you know, instinctually doing. He's just following instinct, which is, you know, that's kind of what vengeance does. Vengeance does as vengeance does. And he says, who put a contract on the Archfiend? So the Archfiend is another name for the devil. And Angelo Puccinello is now referred to as the devil. Well, the devil in Norse mythology. It can be referred to as Loki, because he is the god of mischief and trickstery and all these bad things. We'll get into that more later. But when you look at Angelo Puccinello, remember, devil, mafia boss, Loki. There you go. Then Monasac says, this one's mine. This is my contract. <laughs> I, don't know, I don't really know how that fits together. She's like, because he asks, who put the contract on him? And she's like, I did. I hate the guy's guts because he's a wife beater. And remember, her twin sister is the guy's wife. So beating her sister is like beating her in a way. It's like in the mirror. And she can see, it's like her seeing herself getting beaten by like another self. That's what's great about twins. The whole twin du duomology, whatever you call it, duology. Twins are great for a symbolism and like mirrors. And uh, I really wish they had more twins in noir. Twins, Basil. What's interesting to note is that twins also relates to Baldur and Holder. Holder is the god of darkness, and Baldur is the god of light. So technically there are two twins in this, uh, well there's a lot of twins in this story. Not like biological twins, but you, know, you got the Finito brothers, they're twins, and like how they, they deal with things. You have a trio later on, that could be with the Norns. You have this girl with a twin, but and then you have, you know, uh, Balder and then Holder, but Holder is going to be later on. So hold her on that one for a minute. I just want to mention that twins are like when you have one god and they they relate to like the same thing or the same or two halves of the same thing. So they're identical to each other or both place of a god in mythology. And then in this story, the twins are taking the same place, but different sides. Like she's the shadow of the... She, she's a dark one, and then her sister is like the beaten, tormented, pure one. Uh, she's not pure, but you know what I mean. She's the, the damsel in distress. So there's two sides of this feminine archetype for the protagonist kind of area. There's a damsel in distress and the femme fatale. Damsel in distress is in relation to Eve from the biblical Genesis story. And the femme fatale is in relation to Lilith, because Lilith is an independent, don't need no man kind of woman who was born beside Adam. Not from Adam, beside Adam. So Lilith became the femme fatale, the evil woman who later on, I think that she ate babies, right? She ate, she ate babies? She was a baby eater, right? And then Eve had babies. So, the damsel in distress has babies, the femme fatale eats babies. And uh, one thing that I thought that was funny is that whether you're a damsel in distress or a femme fatale, in noir you do cause a downfall of a man. Because <laughs> if you're Eve, you cause the man to sin. The damsel in distress, you lead the man to sin if he follows you. Which is what men do when they seek vengeance. They follow what they believe are the wishes of the woman, the damsel in distress, and then they end up eating the apple from the tree of knowledge. And that's what entering vengeance is all about. Uh, you're also going to see apples later on in the second game. Just to mention that real quick. Uh, Mona Sachs is eating an apple in the second game. And I remember that very clearly. I'm like, why is she eating an apple? Oh, right. B Bible. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> So I'll get to that one later, but I just want to say I'm not pulling this one out of my ass. She's literally trying to be a biblical reference, but here she's a femme fatale. She is Lilith. She's not the damsel in distress, but in the second game she does become the damsel in distress. So what the hell's going to go? Oh my god! It, it it gets confusing. All right, I'm not I'm not gonna lie about that. It gets confusing once the second game kicks in. I <laughs> femme fatale is French. 
I think, for woman to die for or woman who gets you killed. Either way, the woman's there and you die. And, <laughs> and that's why it relates to Lilith because Lilith is considered like the biblical first femme fatale. And a lot of femme fatales in noir movies were based off of biblical things since Fittis Lung, the director of movies like Dial M for Murder and Scarlet Street, and he also made Metropolis. He's the guy that started like noir in general. Or at least he helped create it and refine it to what it is now. And uh, Fritz, he German. He was he was a German guy. So of course he naturally combined Norse mythology with Christianity to make a bunch of motifs and symbols and themes for his stories. It's all over the place in movies like Metropolis. And it's all over the place in movies like Scarlet Street, which is a movie that you should watch if, if you're into noir and you like Max Payne. Definitely watch Scarlet Street, unless you're only into Max Payne for the action bits. So this one has no action; it's all story, and it's a beautiful story. I love Scarlet Street; it's one of my favorite movies of all time. But either way, um, Mona Sax is a femme fatale, so yeah. Why not pool our bullets for this one? I thought you'd never ask. My finger was starting to twitch. How do you like your whiskey? So Mona, she's like, why don't we put our bullets together and fight this guy together? He's like, yeah, that's a good idea. I was going to shoot you. And she's like, well, since we're joining together now, you want a drink? So let's drink on it. Drinking, ah, oh man, it's hard to say how this connects because drinking is part of Norse mythology again. And I'm going to keep on talking about Norse mythology, but that's what you do when the game is fully based on Norse mythology. In Norse mythology, there was something called the Poetic Mead, or Mead of Poetry, and uh, is a mythical beverage that whoever drinks it becomes a scholar, and they're able to recite any information and solve any question. Alright, you just drank alcohol, and now you're going to enter Berserk Rage, or you're going to have poetic inspiration. There's no middle ground. So... <laughs> That's actually kind of interesting how it relates to, I think it's pronounced as Gvasir? 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 It starts with the K, but it's, it's like Vasir, Klasir. And this guy was born from the saliva of the Iser and the Vanir. So he's supposed to be extremely wise, he travels all over the place, and he teaches and spreads knowledge. Well, what do you think he is? He's spoken word. Because spoken word travels far born from saliva so like when you're talking you spit everywhere and he spreads knowledge so he's like the well you can say he's kind of like the the what's that guy called uh, like the mercury from greek mythology so when she says hey how do you like your whiskey do you want to have a drink with me she's pretty much trying to bring max what is like a metaphorical meat of poetry so either max is going to go into a full-blown rage or he's going to become poetic he's going to kind of gain knowledge into something. And he does, because... Well, let's find out. I'm easy, as long as you don't try to slip me a Mickey. You're a real angel, Max. It was good stuff. Tasted sweet as honey going down. Nothing personal. Can't risk you going berserk and getting Lisa killed. Uh, sorry for cutting that off a little too soon, but... Max says, I'm good, as long as you don't try to slip me a Mickey. And then, plot twist! She slips him a Mickey. I like how it says beer in the background when they were drinking whiskey. <laughs> uh, they're, they're, in the, they're in the part of the club. They're in a different part of the club now. They're in that front kind of area where I said, hey, look at that. It's like a beer. So they, they walked around the club. There's dead bodies over the place. And they have a little smile on while they go clink. You know, they clinky, clinky. And she calls him a real angel. She's like, oh, you're so sweet. You're so virtuous. You're so nice. You're so orderly, right? Because angel means that he's part of order, not chaos. Because he's trying to find order in this chaotic world. That's the whole point of engines, is to find order in the chaotic world. Oh, well, I mean, that's the point of being a god of engines. But, yeah. It's like, oh, it's good stuff. Tastes as sweet as honey going down. Well, what is mead? Mead is alcohol made from da -da -da -da, honey. So, he's drinking the mead of poetry and here she says nothing personal can't risk you going berserk and getting lisa killed well lisa's not killed yet and i say yet because you know spoiler she gets killed but <laughs> right now she's just being beaten so she's being beaten viciously by a sadistic loki of a devil arc fiend demon man who's a mafia boss and she doesn't want him to go berserk 
So that's why she slips him a Mickey of Valkyr. She puts Valkyr into Max's bloodstream, and he goes down to a green spiral, a green black hole. Well, it's a, not, a, not a black hole, but it's a, green, it's a green hole. And as you can see, it's not hard to believe that there's a Norse mythological connection to this thing going on here. Mona Sachs comes in, and she's like, I need you to do this with me. And he's like, all right, I'll help you out. And then so this femme fatale, the woman who brings a man to his destruction, she brings him to his destruction because now he's a Valkyr addict. Or at least he's supposed to be if he took Valkyr. I don't know if it's different if you drink it or if you get injected by it, but oh boy, later on he gets injected by it. So if he's not, addict, if he's not an addict here, he's going to be one later. <laughs> but he pretty much enters the realm of Valkyr and he has this horrible nightmare but this nightmare is actually not that different from other nightmares he's had so it's kind of weird to think that he's had this nightmare before but mm, I'm trying to think if there's like a weird connection to it because if he's had this nightmare before then it's nothing different but if he hasn't then this is like a very unique experience for him that's knowledge gained from the meat of poetry uh the meat of poetry is when uh Kvaser, he gets killed and then they drain him of his blood and then his blood gets mixed with honey which creates the meat of poetry so Kvaser, the god of um well he's not really like a is he a god he's not really a god is he i don't think he's a god i think he's a he's a product of the gods so he gets killed and then his blood gets mixed with honey to create mead and that's kind of like uh you know mixing the yeast is that how they make uh, alcohol? They 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 uh they make it with yeast, right? I don't know how to make alcohol. I'm not a, not a not a booze guy. <laughs> Hard to believe, but I'm not really into booze. Uh, either way, Max drinks what is essentially the blood of product of a god. That's Valkyr, and he drinks the honey. Sweet as honey going down. So that's combined is Valkyr. So incredibly accurate in a modernist way. The nightmare was always the same. Violent shapes moving in darkness, old and ugly. The killer's mad laughter was a riddle filled with wicked innuendo. All right, you can start hearing a little bit of like a baby crying in the background, but he says the nightmare was always the same. So I think this nightmare is always happening to him whenever he falls asleep, which is why people like Max, the noir hero, they never want to sleep because when they fall asleep, that's when the darkness comes in. I might talk about that a bit more later, but I've been rambling so far. <laughs> In this first bit this is this is good i love it and so when people enter their dream state they're entering the ideal the ideal is part of their mind the mind is trying to relive this past and trying to right the wrongs trying to create the ideal the ideal world for them the ideal world is one where they're either punished for being the evil villain or they are praised and treated well or prized they, they are given a, a reward for being virtuous and if max isn't able to do the good thing which is save his family he feels like he's the bad guy. And so throughout this nightmare, you're going to see him feel like he's the bad guy. He's the reason why all those things happen. He feels guilty because he's a cop and he brings bad people to his life all the time. He tried to do the virtuous thing by being a cop, but little did he know, being a cop means you have to deal with scumbags and the worst things of the world and all this stains you. So he comes back home and then he's like, oh man, all, this, all these stains that I bring back home, they gather together, they created a shadow. The shadow is me, or at least it's a part of me, and this shadow has killed my family off, but I'm going to get to that later. I'm just giving you a little bit of foreshadowing. I think it's the second nightmare that he kills himself, but not himself, but like a shadow self. And that's, that's going to be a great symbolic moment for later. But he says, violent shapes moving in darkness. So these shapes are violent but they're moving in the darkness. They're part of the shadow. His shadow's in the deep Jungian part of his brain. And this is beyond your ego, beyond your id, beyond your super ego, you have a shadow. And this is the darkest part of your mind where the shadow is capable of doing every single thing you fear about the world, but it's what's in you. So it is everything you hate that you are now capable of doing because it is part of you. And we are... We're not really able to conceptualize our own shadow until we become possessed by it. And by then it's too late. And that's when you become things like John Wayne Gacy, Ted Bundy, any dictator that's been out there. These are people possessed by their shadows. So Max is now fearful that he is this kind of person, this ugly, disgusting person that he sees all day and every day. These people that he's like, I'll never become like them. I'll never be like Jack Lapino. Who? Jack Lapino? Huh. I can never be like him. Well, you already got the Valkyrie in your bloodstream. What's going to stop you? You already kill people. What's stopping you? 
You know? <laughs> like, where where exactly does he draw the line between him and Jack Lapino now? Once that he fell into that little hole, the Shadow is able to do all these worse things. And that's what Jack Lapino pretty much is possessed by. He's possessed by a Shadow, which is why he became Fenrir. He became the Savagery. Kenny Dawn was possessed by her Shadow. She became a whore, you know? And then uh, Rico Muerte was possessed by his Shadow. He's like a ruthless killer who who just does it because he's sadistic that way. He he does it for fun while Fenrir did it because he didn't know any better. You know, he did, he was, his mind was absent. There was no fun involved with Fenrir. It wasn't like he was having fun. He was just seen as virtuous or just like another day, you know, another Tuesday. Actually, I don't think he saw a virtuous then. He just saw it as another Tuesday. He's like, there's no fun in this. It's just another aspect of life. Oh, you died. Okay, who cares? You know, there is no enjoyment really from that one, so... Yeah, sorry for misspeaking. Uh, then it says, The killer's mad laughter was a riddle filled with wicked innuendo. So, the killer, whoever it was, is a riddle. I have no idea who the killer is. I have no idea why the killer even brought these people to the house. And it's filled with wicked innuendo. Evil. Wicked. Innuendo. Symbols. And, you know, around roundabout ways of doing things. So, in this part of his life, when his family was killed, somebody did a roundabout evil way to kill his family and then laugh about it. So someone's laughing at him or just laughing at the fact that it happened, like, you know, enjoying themselves, amused that it happened, grateful that it happened. You know, oh, this family died. Oh, who cares? You know, <laughs> boy, ha, ha, and that kind of thing. And now we get into the nightmare. Oh boy, my favorite part. Somewhere, the baby was crying. Ah, nice and green. I guess it's green because his brain's just full of Valkyr. And Valkyr's green. The blood of... What was it? The demon's green blood. Alright everybody, time to get your brains warped by the camera. That's Michelle's voice. And I think I hear Max's voice too. Bitch. Yep, that's him. If they did want to make the remake better, they should at least add some kind of like thing following me in this maze, like a minotaur or, you know, demon zombie from outer space or something. <laughs> oh my god, was that Homer Simpson? Don't worry, Homer, I'm coming to save you. Bart, Lisa, Millhouse, uh, Mr. Burns, Peter Griffin, Al Bundy, Hank Hill, <laughs> Donna Pinciotti, all of you people are saving you. Uh, just imagine his brain is just full of like 90 shows and that's all the characters that are like in his brain. That'd be pretty funny. I like that. That might be a good, uh, what do you call it? Homage. Oh, you hear that? Baby stuff. Oh god, so dark. Should have known it when we found you snoring next to Lapino's corpse. A comedian, eh? Huh? Max is snoring. <sighs> me, 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 me. <laughs> That's a little, the little like 1920s little dunce cap thing that the people wore in the old days. Michelle looked at me from the photo. Oh. The Payne family. Happiness captured in a Polaroid moment. I had thought it would last forever, till death do us part. I didn't want to think about it. As long as I didn't, it could never happen. But I had broken my own rule. The thought had already slipped in. Fear was rusty needles poking at my brain. Cold and scaly, it slithered down my chest. So we entered the dream. Max had a little maze they had to go through to enter his main floor of the house. The maze is for confusion. The maze is supposed to be like a labyrinth, a pan's labyrinth, if you will. Being stuck in a maze is very similar to... There's a saying that, like, being a worker these days in modern society is very similar to being like a rat in a maze, and you're hoping that you get the cheese at the end. Cheese is a reward, and the whole time you're putting in a lot of effort, going through a lot of things, things look different, but you're still stuck in the same square. You can't exit the square because you're trapped in it. And so the maze, before you get to this point, is his life before. This confusing, complex mess that is just him getting from point A to point B, but still stuck in the square, this like single unit, right? 
And that's his life before he got married, before he got to this point. He was trapped in a maze. Now he's moving forward, he's progressing in his life. But before that, it was just this complex maze. From the beginning of the house to the living room. The living room is a symbol for his whole life. The parts that made his life meaningful. The parts of his life before the big change. So, living room is going to have pictures, TV, stuff like that. It's going to have things of his life. So remember that part. So he says the Payne family has his wife, him, and the baby. Happiness captured in a Polaroid moment. So the painting, the painting. <laughs> so the picture captured his happiness. The moment that he was happy. And why wouldn't he? He has things that he wants. Wife, kid, progression to human existence. I had thought it would last forever until death to his part. And that's what happened. Death did part. <laughs> I didn't want to think about it as long as I didn't. It can never happen. And, but it did. <laughs> he, he wanted to ignore the idea that the tell death to his part comes eventually. And that's what we do to stay happy, usually. You know, not to get too morbid and to become existential during the talk about morbid existentialism, but yeah. <laughs> we think about only happy things and we try to stick to happy things in order to disguise the reality of things where the till death do us part comes eventually and we had to deal with that. That's what happens. But I had broken my own rule. The thought had already slipped in, so by the time he thought of the till death do us part, that's when he started to slip away. He was kind of worried that, well, maybe my wife's gonna die someday. Maybe I'll be alone. Maybe I'll be isolated. Maybe I'll have to deal with this part of the life that I never wanted to ever think of, let alone deal with. And boom, that's when it happens. Fear was rusty needles poking at my brain. So rusty, corrupted, rotten. I believe I said talked about rusty before, where it's like the corruption, the corrosion of the, of the world itself, the chaos, the so chaotic needles. Needles are very uh, pinpoint. They're very accurate. They're not spread apart. They're very narrow and they inject themselves. They can put, go deep forward, very singular path. That's what fear is. It's a very deep and forward singular path. And that's rusty, corrupted. And it's poking at his brain. So his mind, his brain, his thoughts, he's in a dream. Right now, fear is surrounding him as rusty needles. I wish that they had like, like little, uh, what do you call it? Like, um, like little little hazards in the in the maze where like you, you you like get to the end of the maze and like a bunch of spikes come out or something that would be cool I would like that little like needles going and like drowning him with in Valkyr that dude if they put that in the remake that that would work perfectly well he says uh, cold and scaly is slithered down my chest so fear is as a snake so the fear the corrupted corrosion of things is like a snake well the Midgar serpent in Norse mythology was a snake that corrupted and corroded the world, the tree's roots, the real tree's roots. And another thing about snakes is in the Bible, where, you know, you have the snake, Satan, or the devil, whoever it could be, and the snake leads people to destruction, this fear. Fear and snake. I mean, we have, like, a primal fear of snakes, and some nutbags out there, they say how cute snakes are, or they like snakes, and it's like, well... That's great, but that just means you enjoy being scared, <laughs> you know? <laughs> you, you, you find, like, a cuteness in scared. You find a cuteness in predatory... Ah, oh, man, the, the idea of a snake, because when... Uh, there's, a, there's a talk with Jordan Peterson where he talks about snakes and how they're, like, a symbol of chaos and relate to dragons and such and such. And his explanation is like, we used to be monkeys, and there was a moment when we were monkeys hiding in trees, and... We had to be fearful of snakes because a giant boa constrictor or something like that would just grab us from the branch and eat us alive. And as we're screaming, like other monkeys watch in horror as like, <laughs> I, know, I know I should be laughing, but it's like, just imagine like see, you, you're a monkey in a tree and you see another monkey and then like, I don't know where you think it's a branch and it's like, no, it's a snake. And the snake just like coils around you and eats you alive. And all you can do is just scream, you know, like, <laughs> you just scream like a monkey does. <laughs> Let out a frightened, fearful monkey scream as your eyes bug out in horror, as you watch <laughs> your fellow monkey friend like be eaten alive. <laughs> I'm sorry. It's just a funny image in my head. But, um, yeah. And that's why snakes and fear kind of like go hand in hand, symbolically. Not always in real life, not everybody has to be afraid of snakes. But symbolically, fear, snakes, chaos, they're connected. Thank you. The
pictures were filled with good old times. The Hero Cup. Alex and I had a few moments of glory between us. Crime fighting comrades, the best in NYPD DEA collaborative team. Good hearted macho bullshit like that. I would have given anything to have him here as my backup. No such luck. No luck at all. This is a great moment. So, this was not seen in the actual house that he were in, in the first mission, but here we have this newspaper that Max has always been praising himself for. I think the picture of him and his partner is supposed to be like in his office. So like his office life and his house life combined in this moment, as well as his past. He's like, they're hero cops, oh, they're so heroic. Um, Alex and him had a glory day, so they're like heroes. Everybody praises them. And then lo and behold, he gets into this moment where now he's a villain in the eyes of society because he's wanted, he's a wanted man. The news reports that he killed his best friend because he was in the area at that time and somebody tipped the news off saying, yeah, it was Max Payne, he killed his partner. These heroes, there's frauds. The whole history behind them is wrong, you know, like. <laughs> and so there are crime fighting comrades, the best in NYPD DEA collaborative team. So they were against drugs, they were with the NYPD, and they were collaborative, they were a team. And it's interesting to think of Max as Vidar because Max is supposed to be vengeance. Vengeance is also related to justice. But Boulder is supposed to be the god of light, so the light was killed, and people think that vengeance killed light, but in reality, darkness killed light, thanks to Loki. And Loki tricked people into thinking that it was Vidar. Vengeance. And although Boulder was supposed to be invulnerable, except for the missile to the brain or whatever the fuck it was. Uh, good-hearted macho bullshit like that, I would have given anything to have him here as my backup, so, uh, Max is begging for light to enter his life again. He wants light in his life again. That's what he's saying here. He's like, I want the sunshine. I want the sunshine. I want the goodness of the world. I don't want to be stuck in this dark and evil winter horror land anymore. And he's like, nope, not gonna happen. It's dead. It's gone. Which pictures are these? It's the Manson family? Newspapers with blood on them. Somebody's out of tampons. Oh, well, nothing left in the living room. Let's go check upstairs. Come on, everybody. Guys, this place is so trashed. It's like the lady of the house died or something. crap out of me. <laughs> so there's like earthquakes, there's glass appearing after the shattering. That was poorly rendered. I think they had to draw it onto the ground. Look at that. That's not actual like assets. So that's just drawn on the ground. <laughs> but here the door is barricaded and then in real life it was just uh, blocked by some kind of cabinet or whatever it was. Alright, the baby's room leading to bloodstains. I really love to watch cartoons. Captain Baseball Bat Boy is my favorite. Right, some guy is saying that Captain Baseball Bat's his favorite. That's the guy who's beating up Max right now. Alright, I'm stuck to the wall. Oh, barely. Okay. And I gotta follow this. People thought this was an umbilical cord. No, it's not an umbilical cord. <laughs> it's a blood trail, okay? You follow blood trails as a police officer. This is in Max's mind because he followed blood trails for his job. Umbilical cord. <laughs> Yeah, everybody's a umbilical cord because baby, right? <laughs> Captain Baseball Bat Boy's my favorite anime, next to Koi in the house. Oh my god, my heart's pounding. Oh no, it's good. I'm gonna fall down. This is going to be really annoying because I had to really tiptoe my way and the baby's crying. Max is not wearing the right shoes for this. Yeah, I might as well have Lloyd Christmas doing the most annoying sound in the world for a 10 hour loop. It wouldn't be that bad if the puzzle wasn't broken. Oh no, I went the wrong way! Alright. 
Come on, everyone, you can do this. Just don't slip off. I'm gonna slip off the wagon. Oh! At least I'm not stuck to the ground. So that's a blessing. I am slipping left and right, though. Was it like five babies now? <laughs> I'm surrounded by babies. Joe Biden. <laughs> Joe Biden sends sends a heavy breathing meme. Whatever happened to heavy breathing meme? Nobody uses that anymore. Now it's a uh, surprise Pikachu face and uh, uh what's that? The Shaquille O'Neal. Eating chicken. Right now, Max is in the I sleep meme, but pretty soon it's going to be the real shit. Okay, I think it's this way. Oh! I think I found it! Or did I find the way back into where I came from? I see different stuff. This is it! I did it! No. No, no, please God, no! Oh Jesus, that was an actual dead baby. The spirits are trying to communicate with me. D-E-A-D. -E dad. I'm the dad. <laughs> <laughs> it says daddy <laughs> I'm sorry I'm just too stupid <laughs> Slice them, dice them, shoot them full of holes, blow them to bits, vaporize them, disintegrate them. No matter what you do, they'll still be back good as new. I honestly don't know what he's talking about, but it sounded badass. Alright, look at the cabinet, nothing there. Michelle's diary lay on the table. The diary? Michelle was working part-time in the district attorney's office. Her diary was open on today's entry, her handwriting all pretty curves. An army dossier found its way to my desk yesterday. Valhalla? Isn't that a Norse myth? Something about Vikings? I tried to tell Max about it, but he was busy. That cute frown on his brow. Guess it's nothing. Just a mix-up at the courier service. From now on, I would always find time for her. It was a hollow promise. Too little, too late. Oh, goodness gracious. Look at that face that he makes. Ah, oh, it's heart-wrenching. Give me chills, too. So, Michelle is a part-time worker at the district attorney's office, and for a pleb like me, I need to look up what district attorney means. Okay, so she was um, somebody who works with, like, the state and, uh, like, lawyers and stuff, I guess. I don't know district attorney stuff. I'm not a district... <laughs> You're like, I'm some kind of political person. <laughs> But uh, she worked at the district attorney's office, and uh, here she has a diary. And this diary is actually a representation of stuff that his wife told, you know, stuff that Michelle told Max. And this is all written down, the stuff that's going to be written forever, of stuff that she told him, of stuff that he didn't listen to. And she says, an army dossier found its way to my desk. So somebody from the army came to her desk, Valhalla. She's like, oh, there must have been a mix-up at some courier office. She wasn't supposed to see that. She was not supposed to see that at all. Valhalla becomes big later on. So we see the word Valhalla here. Valhalla, Hall of the Fallen Warriors that work with the gods. And they become the, uh, that word that I can't pronounce, uh, Ysgurd or something, the Army of One. And uh, she thinks, oh, something about Vikings. Sounds like nonsense to me. So she didn't even like care. And he didn't care either. The Max didn't care. He was busy. He didn't have time for her. He wasn't listening. He didn't know. And even if he did know, it wouldn't have made a difference. But this is where his guilt comes in. This is why he has that face of like, well, it's like if somebody killed this family in front of him. <laughs> just pale. Look how pale he looks too. That's great. I love that. But they make him look pale and dopey, just like very like absent mind. Like he looks like he got shell shocked. He looks like one of the characters from All Quiet on the Western Front. 
And here he's like, now I have time for her. I'll always have time for her. But it was a hollow promise because she's already dead, dude. Like, of course you got time for her. Now the time for her is up in your head. So, you have all the time in the world for her because she's not requesting anything. She's not telling you anything anymore. And that's a really weird thing to think of. It's like, yeah, I got time for you now, but only in my head. Only in my dreams, pretty much. Because the dreams don't really have a time limit, do they? I mean, they do, but I don't know. It's hard to determine how much of a time thing is involved with dreams. I don't know how valid something like Inception is, but uh, too little, too late. So that's sad and stuff. And uh, yeah. Let's enter the room. Mac, no, please, Mac. Why? I didn't mean to. I'm sorry. So it shows Max killing somebody off screen. Bullets falling down. Murderer! You killed her! Nothing like that ever happens in a real world. And now we enter part two. 